I want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming today. It's a, a great showing of uh, current people who've worked for us and, and past people. Um, we'll kick off. My name's Todd Schrader. I am currently the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary here in EM. Um, Ike White, our new uh, Senior Advisor for Environmental Management, wishes he could be here, but he couldn't due to previous commitments. Um, with that, I will uh, get us kicked off by introducing our Undersecretary, uh, Paul DeBar, he's the, uh, the group in which EM is, is uh, in that group under him, and uh, he's going to come in and open the ceremonies with a few words for us. All right. Well, uh, thanks for everyone joining us here today, whether it's uh, from across the sites that are here, people who are, are watching virtually. Uh, and obviously many people here who uh, are alumni uh, and, uh, and obviously actively here at the department uh, uh, here in D.C. Um, this feels like a reunion, right? I walk around this room and I see a lot of people who I've known for uh, I've met a, a qu quite a long time ago and hopefully each of you uh, see a lot of people who you haven't seen here before, whether it's from across the complex or previously worked here and, and, and so on. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many people. Um, it's, uh, it's honored, obviously, to be here uh, with people who are at the top of their fields. There are many people here who have a uh, great degree of experience uh, and a great amount of wealth and knowledge of the world uh, about the complex and about the environment. Uh, and uh, I would also like to especially thank all the congressional uh, offices that are here uh, and the gubernatorial staff and all the, the representatives of the, of the Defense Board uh, and, uh, and of course, across, uh, across the department. Uh, today is important uh, for a number of different areas, not, not just because it's the 30th anniversary of, uh, of, of, the, of, uh, of the program, uh, which was obviously carved out to focus on, on environmental cleanup and environmental management across the complex. Um, I think I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, the, the program has come very far. Uh, there's a lot more to go. And I think it's heading in the right direction. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, when I, set, when I sit back and I think about the history of the program, uh, if you combine my time of being on the EM advisory board with my time as undersecretary, I've been around the EM program for 14 years. So almost half of the time since, uh, since it started. Uh, and a half life's a good number to talk about in this crowd. And, uh, and, uh, and a tremendous amount of progress has been made. Um, uh, I want to give a special recognition to a number of people who are here uh, who have been an important part of where we came from in this, in this, uh, in this program. Uh, I'd like to start, start off with Carolyn Huntoon, who as EM spanned two different administrations uh, and has been a, a member of the advisory board subsequently. Uh, Jesse Roberson, uh, who's here, who prioritized planning for the program, which led to a number of the cleanup uh, successes that are here, uh, Rocky, Fernanda, Mound uh, in, in particular, and obviously uh, a meaningful progress on a number of reactors at D and DF and F uh, that were cocooned, uh, the first sea tank farm uh, that was emptied, uh, AMWTP construction, which we're just finished on. I'll get back to my other, the other, the, the other things that were, that were succeeded, but it's wonderful actually to talk about things that were built and that we are now done on, uh, and continues obviously as a, as a member of the board. Uh, Inez, who's here, uh, dramatically reduced the footprint uh, that made a, a big impact, uh, obviously uh, uh, working with uh, AARA on, on, and, and uh, all, the, all the amount of money that came through that really kind of pushed forward on that. Uh, the AM area at Savannah River was closed. Uh, the demo began at K25 uh, at Oak Ridge uh, and uh, Division 2020 at ETTP, which we're also just about done on. So thank you very much for starting at that. And obviously building the 200 area pump and treat, which once again is is uh, over the hump and shrinking uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, what's at the site there. Uh, and and really, uh, it's really, it's always very positive when you talk about uh, things on, 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 on the down cycle. Uh, congressman Newhouse, I don't know if you see him here anywhere, obviously I talk to the congressman often, uh, who's our current champion in the House, 
uh, the congressman was uh, obviously uh, helps out on, on a number of different topics and, and most importantly uh, securing funding for, uh, for, uh, for, for Congress. And I'd like to give a shout out, obviously, uh, pe people not here, but the overall cleanup caucus, uh, which is obviously, uh, we'll have an event here, uh, I think it's tomorrow, um, is, uh, is uh, well attended and well supported, I think, across the whole complex. So very strong support across all the different members. Uh, and then we got some formal site managers. We got Keith Klein here somewhere, maybe. I used, also used to hang out with Keith. Also an EMAB alum uh, uh, in which he helped out an acceleration of cleanup uh, around Rocky Flats. So three decades ago, the task seemed almost insurmountable if you thought about the number of sites and what the scope was when it was carved out. Uh, our job involved 107 sites. Kind of sounds like LM. That's kind of my other, another one of my jobs. Uh, um, uh, but, that, but from a cleanup point of view, 107 sites uh, must have seemed awfully daunting from the, for those of you who were, the, who were, who were here at the beginning. Um, uh, there's been a long way, and obviously uh, we're not just looking back, but we're looking forward to the future. And it's about our commitment, not only to the progress which has happened, but where we see going forward. Uh, we've completed 91 of the 107 sites. Uh, that's a, that is a tremendous accomplishment. Um, the impact to the environment that this crowd has been the leaders of uh, has, has made a, a significant impact on many communities all across this country. Um, let me give you a few examples of, of what EM uh, is dedicated to in terms of advancing cleanup and I want to share three key examples of how we're renewing that commitment here today. Uh, the first is capitaliz uh, capitalizing on new technologies. I remember talking with Inez about this uh, a while ago now, not to date all of ourselves, but uh, uh, whether it's 3D printing or drones or custom designed robots, uh, using technology to attack complex cleanup and work in a, in a more safe manner. Um, it certainly is part of uh, my particular background uh, where I see some synergies with the science complex in which, you know, in, in the area of fusion, uh, 14 MeV neutrons uh, pr produce a tre tremendous amount of irradiation and some of the same robots that are being used actually for some of those deployments are equally applicable and actually not EM directly, the exact same robots are being used, robotic arms for equipment for, uh, for ITER in France is actually being deployed in Fukushima right now. So it's an interesting overlap between technologies, between science and technologies that can be used for cleanup globally. Uh, secondly, we're uh, deploying partnerships to ensure that the knowledge and gain insights from others. Uh, domestically, we're partnering with a number of large groups. Uh, there's a, a greater enhancement than even in the past with our national labs which obviously I have been focused on significantly, uh, private industry, uh, academics, regulators, and state and local uh, legislators, and other federal agencies. Um, there has been some, uh, I think, some amazing things that have been done around technology. When we've run into uh, bumps in the not so distant past, we've had people such as uh, Jim Oendoff, I know you're here somewhere, uh, uh, identified technology solutions when bumps came along not, not, not that long ago and uh, kept us back on time and, 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 uh, and on target and, uh, and on budget by looking at new technologies and developing them uh, for some, some very specific things that came up here in the not so distant past. Uh, these partnerships allow us to use the best scientific and engineering resources that have been developed over the last 30 years and they have changed. Uh, on how to keep our costs lower and how to accelerate cleanup and how to get cleanup done more effectively. Third, we're reaching out to involve uh, and support our communities uh, where we have our field workers live. Many of you who live uh, here from the various different sites work and, and raise your families. Uh, we have put a tremendous amount of effort building off of what's been done here by leadership in the past. Uh, we're securing new dollars for training at Hanford, for example, at the building, working with the unions particularly on that, 
uh, which I think um, you know, shows our commitment to the importance of safety and importance of, uh, of investing uh, with our local community. Uh, obviously, working with our citizen advisory boards, I think an important part, I was actually just talking with Carolyn about that, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and actually bringing them in, including with college curricula that we've been working with across the country in terms of inspiring the next generation uh, and uh, bring workforce in, which is obviously highly important. So, uh, so what's next? Uh, we'll be, I'll be talking in a little bit more detail about some of the specifics when I'm at the cleanup workshop. I won't be able to, I'm not gonna go in this venue through all the different details. You probably have followed a number of things that we've been doing recently, but I'll talk about that uh, at, at the cleanup. Let me talk to you a little bit about the success stories here in the near term. Uh, uh, obviously, it's an honor to work with the 27,000 some odd contractors that we work with across the complex and the 1,000 federal, uh, uh, federal uh, partners of, of mine across the complex. I think it is a wonderful time. Uh, the remaining 16 offices that we have are some of the most difficult to address. Uh, the complexity and the need for rigorous safety measures require us to do things that are not cookie cutter and we have to attack it in each and every one differently and once again bring new technology in and new situation in uh, as appropriate. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the near-term accomplishments. This is just in the last couple of years. As I mentioned, we've completed the mission at AMWTP and we're gonna be decommissioning it and tearing it down. We've completed the deactivation uh, de uh, decom uh, demo and site restoration at Sprue. We're done. We finished the safe, demo the, uh, the safe demolition of the VIT plant at West Valley. And we are nearing completion of the K Basin at Hanford, the last reactor on the river corridor. Our teams have persevered through a number of different challenges, but we've really turned into challenges into great situations of where they are today. I think everyone knows of Fernald Preserve, the leadership team here in the past worked on, uh, is, uh, is one of the largest man-made wetlands in Ohio with a seven-mile network of hiking. If you go to Carlsbad, you'll see the partnership that we have with our contractors, with the local government and investment. There was a new large, there was an abandoned saloon, which is now a large hotel, which is probably filled with lots of oil and gas workers, actually, probably now. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and as you look through all those different uh, you know, things, I just named a couple of them, but out of the 91 sites that have been completed, 45 properties out of those 91 have been made available for communities for, 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 for use. So basically half have turned into community development. So our monumental task is not complete. There is still a lot of work to be done, uh, cleaning up uh, operations from 75 years worth of the complex doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but as I talked about, I think we should all be proud of what's happened over the last 30 years. Uh, the numbers uh, are obviously uh, speak for themselves. And, and once again, I'd like to thank everyone here who continues uh, to look out for the environment and the move to ball forward. What's been happening here recently, I think is wonderful. And I'd like to thank everyone here who's been here for four to 30 years and has been part of the leadership team here in the past. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Undersecretary. Uh, now, if I could have you turn your attention to the screen, you are all in for a special treat, a uh, screening of a new EM video. It's not been viewed publicly up to this point, uh, so this is your chance. And by the way, I should have mentioned earlier, this event is being live streamed and that the video in this will probably be posted later today. Uh, this video, uh, we took the opportunity with the 30th anniversary to look back on how we got here, where we started back with the Manhattan Project, uh, up through the progress that we're making today uh, with cleanup and transitioning the uh, department and particularly our work uh, into the cleanup of, of the Manhattan Project and the various pieces and parts of it. Uh, so with that, we will play the video and uh, go from there. In 1939, Nobel Prize winning physicist Niels Bohr argued that building an atomic bomb 
can never be done unless you turn the United States into one huge factory. He was right. Although the Manhattan Project took less than three years to make a working bomb, in that time, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers constructed what amounted to a huge nationwide factory with monumental plants to enrich uranium, three production reactors to make plutonium, and two reprocessing plants to extract plutonium from the reactor fuel. America's functional nuclear weapon capabilities ended the war and would impact international relationships forever. Nuclear weapon production escalated after World War II and into the early 50s. The U.S. and Russia entered an arms race during the Cold War, creating a nuclear weapons complex that included more than 100 sites in 35 states and worldwide. Ranging from miles of isolated desert in Nevada, where weapons were tested, to warehouses in downtown New York that once stored uranium. At the same time, America also began investing in nuclear energy research, creating government-sponsored facilities that generated Nobel Prize-winning scientific discoveries, helped us explore new energy options, and even advanced our understanding of space exploration. Investment in nuclear was growing, but so were our concerns for safety and the environment. And although our stockpile of nuclear warheads would help change the course of history again in 1991, the end of the Cold War signaled the end of America's nuclear weapons production. A new era had begun. 75 years of nuclear weapons production and energy research generated millions of gallons of liquid radioactive waste, millions of cubic meters of solid radioactive wastes, thousands of tons of spent nuclear fuel and special nuclear material, along with huge quantities of contaminated soil and water. At the East Tennessee Technology Park, our main challenge has been that the facilities that we have been dealing with are of massive size. For example, the K-25 facility, which was the main processing building at that site, was the largest building in the world at the time it was constructed. And it was one mile long from one end to the other. The Hanford site produced 74 tons of plutonium. The site is a vast 586 square miles with over 1,700 facilities that have to be remediated. To prepare for and manage this massive cleanup effort, the U.S. Department of Energy established the Office of Environmental Management in 1989. EM's first task was to identify the complete scope and characteristics of the 107 site cleanups. A wide range of risks had to be addressed, including concerns like contaminating soil and groundwater. We had lots of contaminated sites along the river, and our cleanup strategy was to protect the river. And the reason the river is so important is it's the livelihood of the cities within the Tri-Cities, the state of Washington, and also the state of Oregon. So we gotta make sure that the river is not contaminated with the legacy of what Hanford left. America's environmental regulations were complex and evolving. And EM had to create the infrastructure, treatment, transportation, and disposal processes to address large quantities of waste. And just like the determined nuclear scientists and technicians who manned these facilities before them, EM delivered on and many times exceeded their goals. Because of the magnitude and complexity of the cleanup, we needed a workforce that was highly skilled, highly trained, and highly experienced. We had to transform that production workforce into more of a scientific study, more engineering and people that understood regulations. All plutonium, uranium, metal, and spent fuel is being safely stored at DOE facilities pending disposition. Thousands of contaminated facilities have been decontaminated and demolished. Over 179,000 containers of true waste were permanently disposed of. And water and soil in 91 of 107 sites across the U.S. have been successfully treated. Now the material from those sites has been put into 55-gallon drums and shipped to the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, which is a half a mile below the surface of the Earth. Today, 
EM and our partners have restored or transferred access to nearly 17,000 acres of land to the American people. Some for public use in the form of parks, historical sites, civic sites, and industrial or office parks. In Washington State, the Hanford B reactor that started our nuclear weapons production back in the 1940s is now a part of the Manhattan Project National Park, along with Oak Ridge and Los Alamos National Laboratory, available to the public for tours. In Oak Ridge, Tennessee, EM has returned nearly 1,300 acres of land, 14 facilities, and most major infrastructure to the community. The site is becoming a multi-use industrial park involving economic development, historic preservation, and conservation. Only 16 sites remain in existing cleanup, but these remaining sites are some of the most difficult to clean up, given unique radioactive waste characteristics. EM's current workforce of more than 20,000 federal workers and contractors include some of the nation's leading environmental scientists and engineers, as well as experts in regulatory compliance and the safe packaging and transport of hazardous materials. This dedicated team applies a wide range of experience and insight to safely and efficiently advance cleanup amid the most challenging conditions. And EM is equally dedicated to addressing the needs and concerns of all our stakeholders, continuously engaging with Congress, tribal nations, communities, local and state regulators, and others on our progress. As it has for 30 years, EM's leadership team will openly discuss our efforts in advancing safe, faster, more cost-effective, and more technically sound approaches to nuclear waste cleanup in support of both human health and the environment. We're getting it done step-by-step step and hand-in-hand in, hand in support of America's future. Our priorities are safety first, engagement with our stakeholders, and bringing in the best and brightest people to do the work. When they get up in the morning, they're thinking about their job. When they go home, they're thinking about it. They're thinking about it in the middle of the night, and when they wake up, they're thinking about it. America's nuclear program made a positive, lasting impact on our world. And the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Environmental Management is working to keep it that way. We also have a chance to today talk with uh, um, three of our uh, longtime employees here at the Department of Energy. Um, and I'll ask them to come up and introduce each of them for a, a quick panel session. Uh, why don't you come on up and I'll, I'll introduce you as we're going. Uh, and then we'll come back to the video as they uh, work out the bugs and get back while we cover our uh, schedule variants uh, at that time. Um, it's my honor to introduce uh, these three committed individuals who are, again, longtime EM employees. Uh, first, I'll introduce uh, Mr. Jim Owendoff. Um, he keeps a low profile. Many of you probably don't know him <laughs> within the building here. Um, but to give a little uh, background on Jim, uh, he served EM more than 20 years uh, in various roles, including acting assistant secretary, principal deputy assistant secretary, and chief operations officer. Uh, today, he's the department's chief risk officer, uh, so his portfolio has expanded dramatically. Uh, prior to that, he was the, he's a veteran of the U.S. Air Force, where he spent more than 25 years serving in the U.S. and overseas. Um, again, Jim. Yes. And we certainly thank him for his service. Uh, next, we have Mel Roy. Um, who is celebrating coming up on 30, an 30 year anniversary herself within EM, uh, quite an uh, accomplishment. Uh, Mel is currently the Chief Counsel and Assistant Director of the Office of Chief Counsel at the Environmental Management Consolidated Business Center out in Cincinnati. Uh, she provides legal counsel to EM small sites and also to the Office of Legacy Management uh, across the country. 
she began her career with EM at Rocky, Flight, Rocky Flats, where she was part of the management team that ultimately led to the successful closure of the facility and conversion to a national wildlife refuge. Finally, we have Thomas Johnson, who is currently the deputy manager at the Savannah River Operations Office at the Savannah River site in South Carolina. Thomas serves as the alter ego of the manager and is responsible for day-to-day -day operations, including human resources and organizational culture, safety and quality assurance, budgeting, project planning, awarding new contracts, and contract administration. Prior to this, Thomas has served in various roles throughout the department, including at ETEC in California, uh, here at headquarters. He was heavily involved in Recovery Act activities um, and has since returned to Savannah River. Uh, so with that, I, uh, I'm going to ask these, uh, these guests, distinguished guests, various questions that we collected from uh, across complex and from uh, various people who submitted them uh, as we move forward. So I will start with an easy question for all of them, and we'll go in order starting with Jim, is um, all three of you have impressive tenures with EM. How have you seen the office change during your time here? All right. Anybody care if this thing works? It's on? Okay, good. Uh, first of all, many of you have asked me who hired me and uh, how did I get here? So uh, you can harass Tom Grumbly right here in the front because he's the guy that hired me, all right? So I, I continue to owe a, a, a debt uh, to him. What I thought I want to do is very quickly, uh, Undersecretary DeBar uh, gave a few highlights, but since my time here, I've had the opportunity to serve each of these assistant secretaries, and I want to just give a, a quick highlight the one I didn't serve was Leo Duffy. Paul Grimm is here, but just to tell you, I consider Leo the father of EM, and he was the one that kind of was rope -a doped in the corner of, of you know, all uh, the sites being on the NPL and trying to figure out what are we going to do. Tom came along then and figured out, all right, now how do we move forward with this? Putting the advisory boards uh, in place. He had the first baseline environmental management report, the infamous Beamer, who many of you grew up with. So uh, that's the thing was put in place that said, all right, how much is this thing going to cost? So it, uh, folks still refer to it today. Uh, also, uh, Defense Waste Processing Facility became operational under his tenure. Uh, Purex B plant were deactivated, as well as West Valley VIT plant were started. Uh, Carolyn Huntoon came to us from uh, NASA and uh, during her tenure, uh, main plant at West Valley was decommissioned, first shipment to True uh, from Hanford, and uh, transfer of spent fuel from wet to dry at Hanford. Many things, though, as we all know, lead up to starting things, and Carolyn was the one who would put it in place, the, the early start of, let's uh, close uh, the Rocky, get that into place as well as uh, Mound and Fennell and those contracts. We all know we do our work via contract. So, Carolyn, thank you very much. Uh, during Jesse's time, now, I, now listen, this is not Jesse's fault, but WTP construction was started <laughs> under her tenure. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't for your lack of trying to get it done, Jesse. Uh, the second thing is disposal cell at Oak Ridge was completed, which we all know is the key thing if you're going to make progress on uh, cleaning up a site. So that was a key activity also during Jesse's time, as well as the site that nobody hears about is Weldon Springs in Missouri was the site that was closed. Uh, gentleman who was not here and who took the most accolades of things being accomplished but did squat to get it there was Jim Rispoli. So anyway, <laughs> so I, I can harass Jim because he and I are good friends, but think of this. Uh, Rocky, Fernald, and Mound were all closed during his time as uh, assistant secretary. So uh, pretty good. And then certainly Inez, 
tell me one other person that can say she garnered six billion dollars for the EM program over and above the normal appropriation that we already had. It was great as for you doing that. Her, she personally with the secretary hawked that money and put the framework in place that the three of us worked on to, uh, to have accomplished. Uh, one other thing, uh, a part of that, we talked about the cocooning of the reactors already up at Hanford, but with those monies, P&R reactor in Savannah River were cocooned, so uh, in place. Very good, Ines. Anyway, that's my story, Todd. Thank you very much for the question. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? Okay. Well, I have a little bit of a different perspective coming from the, the legal viewpoint, and that is at Rocky, we took the opportunity to work with our regulators, and not only the EPA and the federal regulators, but also the state regulators and the local community. And in doing so, we sort of transformed the view that Metropolitan Denver and the state of Colorado had of the Department of Energy. You know, at one point in time, there were nuns, and I can say this because of my background, that circled the site, and we had them you know, basically removed from the site. But now we have a situation where they come out and they celebrate what we have accomplished. So it's watching that transition of going from a site that was an idle curiosity to a major curiosity to a natural wonder. And watching the department transfer from the regulators sort of having this viewpoint that we were being recalcitrant versus the regulators being willing to sit down and work with us and try to reach a common goal. Now recognize we all have our respective roles and the regulators have their responsibilities, the community and the uh, public interest groups have their responsibilities, as well as the department. But the fact that we were able to bring those different groups with competing interests together to help support and achieve the goal of cleaning up Rocky Flats was a major transition, not only for the department, but for the state of Colorado. And we were able to do that with fantastic leadership and a great team of people who were dedicated to achieving a mission and achieving a goal. And watching that transition was an honor and something that I hope would continue throughout EM as we continue to transition from the sites that we acquire which need cleanup to the sites that become the type of facilities that we can give back to the community and turn into uh, another multi-purpose. All right, for, for me, it was kind of interesting. I got the opportunity to speak after Jim and then after a lawyer. And I thought that was gonna be rather interesting to, to have to cover. But I guess one of the biggest changes that I've seen in EM over the years is that EM has become a much stronger owner in the process. When we first started out, uh, we're operating primarily under the m and contract model, and the uh, kind of the dominance seemed to have been mostly with the contractor in the early years. But since that time, uh, the federal staff has become more significantly involved in the process and uh, served as a, uh, I guess, more significant lead in the way things are done on the site. So I think that has been a pretty significant and important change throughout the years. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, a question for you following up here is uh, to build on your, your, uh, your answer about changing of contracts. EM is regularly devising new approaches and solutions and capitalizing on new technologies, especially at the sites. Can you talk about some of the innovative work going on at Savannah River? Yeah, I'd like to cover uh, two things. Um, one of the more recent ones for us has been uh, the at-tank um, waste processing. Um, it's a pretty significant effort. As a point of information, we went from a green field to 
an operating uh, project in two years, which is a pretty significant effort. Uh, certain that the people of South Carolina and reg regulators in South Carolina were uh, greatly impressed with the effort. Uh, we're able, with that particular facility, we're able to process on the order of a million to a million and a half gallons of, of waste per year. Uh, now, it may not sound like much to, to, most, to most, but... No, it's a backup. Okay, it may not sound like much to most, but um, being able to process a million and a half gallons when we have... some 33 million gallons there uh, in the tanks at the site I think is a pretty good accomplishment. The other one that I want to make mention of is a few years ago we had a pretty significant problem with the um, improper use of drones on the site. Uh, it garnered a lot of attention uh, locally uh, for us uh, but what we were able to do is because it garnered the, lo uh, the uh, the attention, uh, it also got the focus of the folks on the site. So we went from unauthorized use of j drones on site to utilizing the drones as a part of the process for the site. We're able to now utilize drones to help us with the mapping over some of our closed waste sites. And we also use drones to help us on uh, some of the reactors uh, by being able to um, apply herbicide at the higher elevations on the reactors without having to send folks up there to deal with it. Thank you, Thomas. Jim, similar question for you. Uh, you've held a number of different roles within EM. Uh, based on this uh, vast experience within the department and, and over the years, what else do you think EM can do differently to improve upon existing processes moving forward? Yeah, you think I'm going to answer that question? Listen. <laughs> I, I think that with, uh, with uh, Ike and Todd, the site managers, the team, all the employees here, as well as the, uh, uh, those in the field and contractors, uh, you are very blessed to have this 30 years of foundation and the energy that has gone before you. And you have the ability, and you've demonstrated it, to, to then take those next steps uh, move forward. I just, uh, just an old guy that's here that uh, uh, I have billables, and if you need me, come see me. But other than that, uh, I'm with you all. It's great. Good to see you. Fair enough. Uh, Mel, looking ahead, what would you say is the biggest overall challenge in the cleanup moving forward, and, and how are various teams working to overcome those challenges? And how are various teams working to overcome the challenges? What are the biggest challenges moving forward? Each one of our sites has a little bit of a different uh, challenge. And it's looking at these challenges not from the perspective of a cookie cutter approach, but looking at a basic core or foundation for what really works and then applying it to those different sites and the different challenges that those sites face. It's uh, sometimes easy to look back and say, well, this is the way we've always done it. But sometimes this is the way we've always done it isn't necessarily the best way, the most efficient way, or the most productive way. So another challenge is being innovative and creative and bold in looking at how to approach these challenges in the future. There are no easy answers to our sites. I was just saying to someone a few minutes ago, if it was easy, someone else would be doing our jobs. We're here because we take on the challenge. And in taking on the challenge, we recognize that there are unique aspects to each one of our sites and unique aspects to the different waste management challenges we have and we're willing to take those challenges and move forward. So I think that uh, the more that we can be flexible and creative in our thinking, the more that we're willing to at least ask the question that challenges the status quo. It may not be the answer, but it certainly may get us to think about how we can do things better. Thank you. Thomas, where do you see the site within the next five to 10 years? 
see if this one's working. Good. Okay, I guess for us, the, the next thing that we've got to deal with is the next round of acquisitions. Um, all of the major uh, contracts for our site is at the point where we need to pursue new solicitation. So we're just trying to, to get those in place um, uh, within the next few years. Uh, typically within EM, the acquisition cycle is about a two-year effort, so we've got to find a way to be able to cut that down some as well as, as we move through it, be able to have the uh, selection stick. Uh, we often find that uh, selections are protested, but one of the things I've often said was that uh, when you have things out there that are, you know, six, 10, 15 billion dollars, at the end of the day, there's usually only going to be two entities happy. The entity that won and DOE, because we got an award in place, and everyone else is going to not be happy and likely will protest, but we've got to be in a position to where we can survive the protest and move on to the, to the new acquisitions. Um, because the competition is good, for, is good for the site and is good for the government. Thank you. Uh, and I'll close with a final question for all three of you. Uh, you've all been with the department quite a long time. What is your most memorable story or moment in your career here at EM? Please keep it clean. Jim, why don't you start? Well, probably uh, opening WIP is most memorable to me. I remember that uh, the evening when we had everything, all the final improvements in from the EPA and the state, and I, I received a council that said, well, maybe you ought to just, just wait another couple of days. Uh, uh, do not wait. I said, uh, nope, we're going. Let's, uh, you know, trucks are moving. We're, shipments are going. And uh, let me tell you, you all have seen it. You've, you've seen those decisions when everything is lined up. Launch. Do not, do not wait because there's many things that can then come, gremlins can come in and, uh, and muck it up. So that's mine. Mel? Rocky Flats would be the most significant for me. And I think it's also one of the more significant accomplishments for all of EM and for all of the department. We accomplished something at a time when we were facing numerous challenges, not only from a technological standpoint, but from the community, from litigators, from regulators, from public interest groups. And it was because of the leadership that we had, the dedication and the support of the various teams that were out at Rocky Flats, and not only the feds, but the partnership that we had with our contractors, the partnership that we had with the community eventually, and the partnership that we had with the regulators eventually, led us to achieve the closure of Rocky Flats with the significant savings and certainly a significant savings of dollars and time. So that to me is the, uh, the proudest moment. And then similar to Jim also having to uh, support the opening of WIP and watching those first trucks roll out of Rocky Flats on the way down to the WIP site. Thank you. All right. Thomas. All right. For me, it would be two items. Um, the first one would be the Recovery Act and the successes that we were able to achieve on the Recovery Act. It was mentioned before that we had an extra $6 billion, and that $6 billion was utilized to greatly reduce the contaminated footprint within the Office of Environmental Management. I think we started out with a goal of a 40% reduction, and we ended up with approximately 74% reduction. It was also a time when uh, we were able to put a lot of folks back to work. There were many tens of thousands of folks that were able to uh, work during the Recovery Act time. The second one that I'd like to make mention is not something that is nearly, uh, and that's not here, heralded as, as much as the Recovery Act, but it's the work that we've been able to do with, in South Carolina with the local colleges and universities. Uh, through the grants uh, that we have with the local colleges, universities, and HBCUs, uh, we were able to reach out uh, to the community, to the next generation. As you've been 
you hear me? Okay, to the next generation of workers. So we've been able to, to utilize that and we've been able to bring folks in on uh, internships and whether on the federal side or through our contractors, uh, we've been able to uh, bring many of those interns on as uh, full-time employees. Now it provides a lot of benefits uh, to the area. Um, if you visited uh, Aiken, South Carolina, I do love Aiken, but it's not uh, not necessary. It, it gets billed as a retirement community. It gets billed as a great place to have a family. But if you're early in your career or early in life and you're just ready to start a family, Aiken, South Carolina isn't always viewed as the greatest place to be. Um, so, but anyway, we were able to to do some work with the local colleges and universities and help bring on the next generation of workers. Thank you, Thomas. And with that, uh, please join me in thanking all of our three panelists. Here. Let me say this guy did a fine job here, up here. We will try, I believe, the video again here after our mock-up and dry run earlier uh, to make sure we got there, um, I think. Maybe, maybe not. All right. So with that, so with that I appreciate everyone coming. You know, one of the things that's really important uh, that we all understand is uh, this has been a a uh, journey to get here that, that's built upon the work of many, many people uh, before and, and going forward uh, um, for the complex and for the cleanup. Uh, and for that, we thank you, everyone involved here, just about everyone, the contractors, the federal workforce, the regulators, everyone are all key to bringing this together. As for this event in particular, uh, it's always difficult to bring this together, and I'd like to thank Gene Beard and, and the uh, communication team of Anita uh, I, I Caruso, Julian Mahan, Lauren Malone, Sherry Lawson, Wayne Whitley, and Darlene Prather. Uh, they did a lot of work over the last few months to get to this point coming forward. <laughs> also, as, uh, as you came in, if you noticed the, uh, up on the screen, I think we'll probably play it again uh, during the reception, uh, there was uh, various images of workers around the complex. We call it EM Spotlight, and, and these are people who, who uh, day in and day out go above and beyond and, and really do a good job uh, for that. So in recognition to all of those people, they will be receiving a uh, EM coin. We don't give these out as much as we used to, but uh, we're trying to um, um, for all their efforts and, and hope to make that an um, a, uh, ongoing process where we recognize people across the complex uh, moving forward. Um, so with that, I think we will uh, uh, end the live stream portion and the, uh, the last part of this uh, ceremony, frankly, is uh, the reception. And this is where you get to, to meet everyone, meet old friends, meet people you used to work with. Uh, there's some uh, food back there for everyone to enjoy. And so with that, I thank you for coming and, and hopefully you enjoy the rest of the reception. So thank you. Thank you.